Well, hey, everybody, man, it's great to see you today, and I'm glad to be with you this weekend. We've had a couple of exciting weeks at our church. A couple of weeks ago, we uh, were the host to a group of pastors from Egypt and Iraq, and they were just incredible leaders. And I think about what they do putting on, uh, put, you know, for their faith every day. Uh, of how much of a sacrifice it is for them to be Christians in their locale. And so continue to pray for them. We had a great week together. And then I got them on the plane, headed out on Friday, and we hosted another group of my personal pastor friends. We've been in a group for the past 18 years of sort of accountability uh, with a group of 20 pastors and their wives uh, from all across Virginia. And they came in on Sunday. We were fortunate to host them here in southwest Virginia, give them a little bit of our Appalachian heritage. And we just had an incredible time together. Got those guys back to their churches Thursday. And uh, it's been a great time, a busy time, but just so exciting to see how God's using our church in different platforms across our state and across our world. So we started uh, this series a couple of weeks ago, and we asked you to sort of begin to think about where God is at work. And during the midst of this, uh, as you know, there was a, a, a hurricane. This Florence deal came through and ravaged a lot of our communities uh, in our neighboring state in North Carolina. And our campus pastor in Johnson City, Cameron Lee, and his wife, uh, we asked you to sign up if you wanted to go help, uh, to help in some of those disaster places. And they led a, a team last week. You may have seen some pictures of all the things they were doing. Uh, we had uh, quite a few of you sign up. Uh, they got back in on Friday, and we have another team going out in a couple of weeks. Melissa McFarlane is leading that team. And uh, I would encourage you, if you can take a few days off work, uh, to be able to go and to help our neighbors. Can you imagine? Uh, Holland wants to be on the front edge of any kind of disaster that we have in our country and around the world. And so I'm very grateful that many of you are going to go and help these folks. So, again, we'll give you many opportunities to do that. Well, uh, uh, in this series, Known, uh, we're talking about how to discover God's will for your life. Because uh, that's the you know, number one question I get over and over and over. People will ask me, hey, this is a situation I'm in. These are the circumstances we find ourselves in. And so the question then generally comes, what do you think God wants me to do in this situation? And so I thought about that, and I thought, well, let's develop a couple of months' worth of messages around this, and then let's ask you not only to come on the weekend service, but to think about taking your next step and join us at a campus uh, during the week. At Marion, they meet on Sunday night, and here in our other locations, we meet on Wednesday night. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you have decided to take me up on that offer and it's just been so neat to see so many of you at all of our locations taking your next step to go a little deeper in your Christian faith and think about actually becoming part of a small group. That'd just be phenomenal for you and for our church. So thank you for all your encouragement. Uh, thank you for the emails you've sent. Hadn't gotten too many negative ones. That's unusual for me. And so I appreciate your kindness. All right. So it's been good. Well, today I want to continue to sort of move into that, and I want to encourage you to take out your notes because we give you some notes uh, because you may be like me, and the time you get out of the parking lot today, you forget what I've said, but if you'll write a couple of things down, then somewhere in the future weeks, and you begin to think and you find yourself in a situation about what to do in this situation. Maybe you could reflect back on some of the notes we've given you and God might help you and encourage you. So I want you to take notes. And while you're doing that, uh, I want to share a few things with you. A few weeks ago, I went to the mailbox and I got from the mailbox an, a really nice invitation. And most of the time they're addressed to Brenda. This one was addressed to me. I was pretty excited about that. And I opened it up. And it's an opportunity to play in a golf tournament uh, that was a fundraiser for a worthy cause. And I thought, man, I love getting invitations like this. And as I read that invitation and got excited about it, I realized just how many invitations we get. We get invitations every day, don't we? Uh, sometimes we get nice ones through the mail. Sometimes we get them through our Facebook page. Sometimes we get them through email. Uh, sometimes somebody calls us and invites us to something. 
And I begin to think about the kinds of invitations we receive, you know. Uh, we get good ones like this golf tournament deal. I love getting invitations for dinner with somebody. Uh, you, know, you know, those kinds of wedding invitations. I mean, you get a lot of good ones. And then uh, this week, I went to the mailbox, and I got an invitation to pay my taxes. Now, that wasn't as nearly as excited about that as the ones I'd gotten earlier. Uh, you know, uh, I remember when I turned 50, I got an invitation from the doctor for a colonoscopy. And that one was one I'd just soon pass on. Uh, jury duty. Maybe some of you have gotten invitations to serve on jury. And, hey, you can't even decline that one, right? You can't even turn that one down. You have to go ahead and serve and do your civic duty to serve on jury duty. And it just began to resonate within my mind uh, we're getting invitations all the time. Some we're excited about, others we just soon pass on. But what do you do with all these invitations that come your way? And what I wanted to talk to you about today is I want to share with you what I think is the greatest invitation you'll ever receive. The greatest invitation you'll ever receive. So on your notes, notice these um, reality diagram that we started with as we're trying to help you to know God's will for your life. We set the foundation, and then we came right out of the gate a couple of weeks ago, and I taught you that God is always at work around us. He's always done that. He's always going to be God somewhere at work around you all the time. And then last week, while I was entertaining all these pastors, I asked Pastor Mark to speak, and I asked him to sort of teach us that God wants to pursue a relationship with us, that he wants us to grow deeper in our Christian relationship with him. And as we grow deeper, then God uses us in more amazing ways as we get rooted and founded in him. Now, today what I want to talk to you about is this third reality. And this, again, I think is the greatest invitation that we'll ever receive. So I don't want you to miss this. Write this down. Reality number three, God invites me to become involved with him in his work. He invites us. Now, this is really exciting to me, to actually be invited by the creator of the universe. You know, think about this, guys. This is not a, you know, this is not a, a you know, just one of those crazy invitations. But God our creator invites us to be a part of what he is doing in his work around the world. So what exactly is God inviting you to? Have you ever thought about this? Well, uh, we know that God has always been working to redeem a lost and broken world. The Bible tells us that all of us have turned our backs on God. We've sinned. Isaiah says we've gone our own way. And God's plan from the very beginning was to bring us back to him. So what did God do? Well, he loved us so much. The Bible says that he sent his son Jesus into this world. And Jesus Christ died on a cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins and we could be made right with God. And once we decide to ask Jesus into our lives and that we find this forgiveness that only he can offer. I mean, he's the only one that can forgive. Then God invites us to be part of his plan to rescue a broken and lost world to himself. So let's look at this because I want you to understand this is not just me talking today. This is really what God's word teaches. And we find this several times in scripture, but let's look at how Jesus explains it in Matthew 28. Look at verse 18. Jesus says, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, Jesus says, I will always be with you. <laughs> I will always be with you even to the end of the age. Now, we refer this scripture as the great commission of Jesus. But I want to tell you, I'd like to rename it today. And I would say, let's call it the great invitation that Jesus gives us to join him in his work. Here, God invites us to be a part of his plan to take the good news, and it is good news, to all the world. And if we're a child of God, uh, I want to encourage you to take God up on his invitation. So every day, God invites you to join him because he's at work in your world. And you've got a choice to make. Are you going to join God in what he is inviting you to pursue with him? Are you not? 
God doesn't pressure you to join him in his work. You can say no. God gave you a freedom of choice. Just like you can say yes to Jesus Christ, you can invite him into your life, you can become a child of his, and you can be saved for all eternity, and when you die, you can go to heaven. Or you can say, nope, I like my own plan better. I'm going to be my own God. I don't believe in this stuff. And when you die, according to the Bible, you're going to go to a place separated from God and his love for all eternity. It's a place called hell. I would encourage you to join God in his invitation to you. And if you decide to join God now as a Christ follower, then what do you have to do? Four things. Let's look at these real quick. Stay with me. Here's the first one. I have to actively watch for God working around me. Just got to get that mindset. God's working around me, and he's working around us all the time. And most of the time, guys, here's the deal. We're so busy with our own world and our own plans and our own thoughts that we don't even think that this is God that's working around me. I don't know if this will make sense to you or not, but this is, I wanted to try to explain it to you this way. When I became a senior in high school, I had a couple old clunkers. And you know, in those days, every young man wanted his own ride. I mean, it was just a ride of manhood, you know, sort of a passage. And you sort of dreamed of the day that you would get your own vehicle. Well, we didn't have much, and uh, the car that I got to drive when I did get to drive was this old Plymouth Newport. Some of you might remember what that was. The thing was as long as the country tent. You know what I mean? It was about 100 feet long. It was lime green. Um, it was just a grocery getter and a half. You know what I mean? It was just an awful car. But when I had the opportunity, because I love to drive so much, then I would take that into the student parking lot, take up a couple of places in the parking lot because the thing was so big, and I would try to navigate that thing home. Well, I remember uh, during my senior year, as it started out, that I went by this used car lot. I went by it every day, and I saw this little Mercury Capri. It was sort of like a little sports car. Uh, nothing fancy. I think it was like $1,600 was the price tag used car. It had about 100,000 miles on it or so. But I just thought, man, I have never seen a car like that in my life. This thing's so unique. I, you, that car has my name on it. So I go to my dad, who is a tough guy, you know, and I said, Dad, is there any way? I mean, I'll do anything, you know, whatever it takes. You know how kids are. And I said, I, that car's got my name on it. I said, anyway, no. No, stupid. You know, it's almost like that's a stupid request. I'm, I'm not even going to entertain it. But you know, it seems like sons have a way with moms. And so <laughs> I gave the guilt complex to my mom. I said, Mother, I said, every, every senior guy's got a car. I mean, it's not that much. You know, I'll work. I'll pay you back. That was a big lie. But I'll pay you back. You know, <laughs> whatever it takes, I've got to have this car. And sure enough, against my father's wishes, which I wouldn't recommend for a healthy marriage, it sort of set them back a little bit, but she went with me, and we bought that little car. And I just thought I was a rock. I mean, I felt like I had arrived. I'm a rock star, you know. And here's the deal, guys. I drive my first day. I take that thing home. I get it spit-shined. I mean, it is clean as a whistle. And on my first morning going to school, you know what? Passed two cars exactly like it. I could not believe it. I mean, we're living in a small town. By the end of the week, there's one in the daggone parking lot, just like it. And I thought, I've been oblivious to this the whole time. I finally get my dream car, and it seems like everybody's got one. Now, I don't know if you can relate to that at all, but I think most of us can. And here's what I want you to understand. That's exactly how it is when we discover God's will. God's around us all the time. He's working constantly in our midst. But we have to tune our minds into what God is already doing. And when we do it, then we see where he's working around us. And we see that it's him. And he gives us it, this invitation to join him in his works. Pretty incredible. This is what Jesus did in his ministry. It's the reason I can assuredly say this is what God wants us to do. Notice here in John 5 what Jesus says. In chapter 17, verse 19, he says, My father is always working, and so am I. I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. And whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. So in this passage, 
we see that God is always working, and Jesus is only doing what he sees his Father doing. It's all Jesus does. And it's the same for us. You know, honestly, God wants to show you where he's working, and then he invites you to join him. Here's the coolest part. This is a personal invitation for you. Not everybody's going to be invited into this specific work that you see God working in around you. And so often we're just too busy for his invitation. Uh, let's bring it down to reality. Let's get a little practical. Maybe God's been nudging you. Some of you have been emailing me and, and uh, different notes that I've gotten through Messenger. And you've just said, you know, during this series, I'm becoming more aware of God working around me. And maybe God is nudging you. You know, maybe... Uh, uh, you have a coworker that's in a relationship crisis, and God's sort of nudging you to talk to that person. Um, maybe you're here at one of our locations, and God's given you the, uh, you know, the ability to sing, and He's sort of nudging you. Hey, you know, think about trying out for one of our worship teams and help other people, you know, uh, enjoy God in worship. Now, God's not. That's not me, all right? I mean, he's not, he's not nudging me to do it. He wants me never to be on a worship team because it would be a disaster. But maybe some of you, you know, he's given you that gift to do more with it than just sing in the shower. And he wants you to bless other people with the gifts that he has given you. So maybe he's nudging you in some way. God's already working in people's lives around you. And he's choosing to use you to draw other people closer to him. So the first step is you just got to be able to see where God's working. Uh, this is something just practically, I'd say in the morning when you get up, just pray and say, God, uh, help me to see where you're working today. Uh, Lord, I, I want to see. I don't want to miss these opportunities of invitation. So God, just, just help me to see where you're already working. I don't want to miss that. So that's the first step. Here's step number two. Write this down. If I'm going to join God in his invitation, I have to allow God to use my gifts for his purposes. Notice here in 1 Peter 4, look at verse 10, it's what it says. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Now catch this, look what it says. Use them well to serve yourself. Is that what it says? No. God has given you a spiritual gift. You are to use it well to serve one another. One another. If we're going to join God, we've got to shift our thinking from using the gifts that we have to serve ourselves and use the gifts that God's given us to serve others. Uh, you see, God has prepared you. He has shaped you for the invitation he sends you. You were designed by God to join him in the work that he invites you to. Notice what Paul tells Timothy. He says this. He says, God, don't neglect the spiritual gift, Timothy, that's in you. Don't just let it sit there being unused. Now, if you're a child of God, you have a spiritual gift, and you can figure out what that is. If you're not even, you're here today, and you're not even a Christian, God has still given us all, Christian, non-Christian, this gift of time. You know, we all have 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 365 days a year. Have you ever thought about this? How are you spending your time? Are you using any of the gift of time to join God in his invitation? So in front of you in the seat, there's a little card called a connection card. And these are some opportunities on that connection card where we know God's already at work in our church. And I would love to invite you to help us join him. Uh, we've shared our new vision where we just believe we went through this before I shared it with you with all of our staff and all of our lead team. And for a number of months, you know, we just said, God, we want to join you. We know you're already at work. We don't want to miss you, God, as a church. And so we know that God's leading us to serve 30,000 people in our communities. Now, we're going to still do things like spread mulch to the schools and those things we've been doing. But we're not going to say we're going to go over to E.B. Stanley or Watauga and put mulch down. Oh, well, we serve, you know, 700 kids. No, we're going to count this as a serve project to an individual person so that we're truly going to serve 30,000 people in our communities. We're going to reach 3,000 just ones. We ask all of you to think about investing in just one other person. And maybe you're here today. After our first service, there was a family who came after me, and they come up to me and said, hey, we got our just one today. 
And I said, that's awesome. And so I introduced them. And as they sort of were going, I said, what would they say? I said, they loved it. They're going to come back. And I thought, what an incredible opportunity. We're going to reach 3,000 just once. We're going to train 300 international pastors from all around the world. We're going to raise up 30 ministerial leaders from our HF college to go into our church and other churches in Appalachia because it's a huge need. And we believe God's directing us to three new locations in some capacity. Now, guys, we need you to join God with us as a church to fulfill the vision God's placed on our heart. I hope you will. Here's the third thing. The third way to join God is to allocate some of my resources for God's mission. Now, let's be honest. I mean, truly, in America, even if you would feel like you're not rich, Compared to the places I travel in Tanzania and these third world countries in Paraguay, we're rich. If we have a roof over our head, we have meals twice a day, then we're in the top 99% of the richest in the world. All of us have been blessed with material resources. And God wants us to provide for our families, obviously. Uh, God wants us to enjoy life. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life. I mean, God wants you. If you're a Christian, he wants you to have an abundant life. God's given you these resources so you can provide for your family, have fun with your family. But God also gives us some financial blessing for a greater purpose, he says, that we can invest in his work around the world. And if you've been to Highlands anytime, you know that every Sunday at Highlands, we receive an offering and always invite you, our campus pastor, to make a meaningful gift. And here's why. Because your giving changes lives for Jesus Christ. Your giving allows us to be the church. Your giving allows us to fulfill this vision that God's placed on our heart to join him, to make a difference in 33,333 people's lives. Notice what Jesus says here in Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, if you're a Christian, these are our marching orders. I mean, it's pretty clear. Your giving literally helps transform lives, not only here at home, but it's going to help us change lives around the world. God's trying to teach us this. Don't just invest things that are here today and gone tomorrow. Now, we have the tendency to do that, don't we? And, and uh, I just want to challenge you to think a little above that. But God says, invest a portion, some of the resources I've given you, into the one thing that's going to last for all eternity. You know what that is? It's people. Are you investing anything in people? I love how Paul describes it, and this is how I want you to view it here at our church. This is what he says to these farmers, the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, he says, Guys, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. We understand that. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. And then he teaches them this lesson about their resources. He says, you must each decide in your own heart how much to give. God gives it all to you, but you get to decide. And then he says this, and I would say this to you. And don't give reluctantly, and don't ever give when you feel pressured to give. We don't do that here. We believe God's asked us to join him. And so we do it the second way. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So if you can't give your offering, your gift to God's work with joy, you need to keep it, all right? You just need to keep it. God will burden, place that opportunity in somebody else's life. And notice what he says. If you do, and you can give joy, because it takes us some point to get there. It says, and God will generously provide all you need. And then you will always have everything you need, and you will also have plenty left over to share with others. You can't outgive God. You know what I've learned? Giving back to God is never a money issue. Giving back to God is always a heart issue. And some of you, I think, God's blessed in just incredible ways, and he wants you to enjoy time with your family. He wants you to 
enjoy the things of this world. However, at the same time, God wants you to invest some of your resources back into his work. Uh, I want to give you one example of, um, you know, we, I could give you hundreds. But I want to give you one. This one's sort of a unique one. We have a family in our church, and they're not well off by any means, but they've been blessed. And they have three boys. And anonymously, they came to me, and they said, you know, we just feel like we're missing uh, an opportunity at our church uh, for these athletic young men and women. We know you got a great youth program at all of your locations, but we've been taking our kids, and we noticed that there's a lot of other families from the Tri-Cities, and they've been going all the way to Charlotte, North Carolina, and Knoxville, Tennessee, to this school for athletic young men and women, middle school and high school kids, uh, called a speed school. And in that speed school, uh, these trainers teach the children how to be faster and quicker and stronger and better. And, uh, you know, it's fairly expensive, three, dollars $400 a month to be able to put your kid in these speed school activities. And so this family came and they said, we've just been uh, fortunate. We would like to try to offer this, no expense to the church and no expense to the kids in our community. We have a young man who's graduating Emory, and he's certified to teach TC Speed. And we'd like to just do it as a ministry, and we think it's fulfilling the vision of reaching just ones. And I thought, man, it's incredible. And the neat thing about our Speed School is that we do all the athletic training for all these kids. And if you have, uh, if you have kids and you're in sports today, you know this is a huge thing. And to be able to do it in the middle of all of our locations, he found a place in Bristol, Virginia, and they do it every Monday night, and they just, it's grown so much, now they do it for high schoolers on Thursday night. And I want, I want you to see a few pictures of this. Here's uh, the kids, they do these agility type training. Here's one of the girls that's down there. Here's our director, Kalen Reinhardt, just an incredible young man. They've had 90 kids come into this ministry. And here's the best part. After they wear them out physically, then they do a little snack, and they share the gospel, the good news with these kids. And that's the difference than all other speed schools in the area. Incredible, free to all of our community. Now, I've been going down to speed school, and I'd love to show you what I've learned, but I'm so quick, they tell me the cameras can't even catch me, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. I'm doing the geriatric, getting ready for a geriatric speed school when I finish my time here at Highlands. But it's just an example of a family who wanted to help fulfill the vision and join God where he's already at work. Here's the last thing, guys. If you're going to decide to join God, then you've got to act immediately in obedience to God's invitation. Let me ask you a question. Is there something you know God is asking you to do? But you just delay it over and over. You keep sort of putting him off. Uh, most of us would say this. God, can you just bless me instead of use me? I want your blessings, God. I'd love to have your favor. I'd just soon you bless me instead of use me. But God wants to use you. That's been his plan from the beginning. And listen, if you want to know God's will for your life, then you just obey him when he invites you to join him in his work. It's pretty simple, actually. When God invites and we obey, it basically means we love him. Notice the scripture here in John 14. Notice what Jesus says. It's our memory verse this week, by the way. A lot of you are memorizing scripture. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Great scripture to commit to memory. This verse helps us to know how to discover God's will for our lives. And if God is inviting you to do something and you're scared to death, just know this. God always provides what he asks you to do for him. Always. Will it be uncomfortable? Absolutely. I'll guarantee you it will push you sort of out of your comfort zone because God hates it when we get comfortable. And he has something more for us. So when you're praying this week and you're looking around you and you see God at work around you, just say yes. Just say, God, I'm available. Yes. Notice this last verse, Matthew 6, 10. 
The scripture says, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So often I pray this prayer, God, not my will, but may your will be done. And may I see you at work around me and may I join you. That's, that's where it's at, guys. It really is. God is at work around you. And if you've been a little bored in your Christian journey, then probably what's happened is life is becoming more about you than about him. Because any child of God I see on mission for Jesus, man, they're so excited. So excited. So I want to give you an opportunity to take your next step today. Our campus pastors are going to come out and help you with that. But I want to pray with you. And if you're here or you're listening online and you've never taken the step of inviting Jesus into your life, then I want to give you that opportunity today. Would you pray with me? Let's have a word of prayer. God, you're an amazing God. Thank you, Jesus, for coming, leaving heaven and giving us an opportunity to be renewed and made right with a holy God. You died on the cross for us. You gave your life for us. We can't fathom. Our minds are not capable of understanding why you would give your life for us. But we're so humbled that you did. And if you're here today and you've never invited Jesus into your life, and maybe you've been mad at God, or maybe something has happened in your life that you just can't convince yourself there's a God who loves you. Maybe the enemy is telling you today, you got to get some things right. You've made too many mistakes. God doesn't care about you. All those things are lies. And right now, you sense this nudge, this tug on your heart. That's God, because he loves you. And he sent his son to die for you. And he wants you to know him, become a part of his family. If you just pray this prayer with me, just say, Dear God, as best as I understand it, I've got some questions. But Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I've made mistakes. All of us have. And today I repent. I, I turn from those sins. And Jesus I ask you to come into my life and save me. Lord, I surrender my life to you. And today, God, I want to see you at work around me. And God, thank you for pursuing me to invite me, the greatest invitation ever, to join you in the work that you're doing around me. Thank you for those who have made that decision today. If you made that decision, hey, we'd love to know about it. The Bible says all heaven rejoices. Lord, thank you for our church, that not only are you using us regionally, but God, you're helping us to become a church that is training leaders all over the world. And thank you for the friends today that we have in 118 different countries around the world. Incredible. We commit ourselves to you afresh in Jesus' name. Amen.